A stereotype threat is just uh, the experience of being in a situation where um, you know that you could be judged or treated in terms of a negative stereotype about one of your identities, your age, your race, your physical status, your what, something of that sort. Uh, and if you care about the situation, and that's a critical part of it, that's really what makes you vulnerable to the threat, is that you care about functioning well in a situation, and yet you know you could be negatively stereotyped, and it's frustrating and distracting and, and can interfere with your functioning right there, just the tension caused by that. That's really what stereotype threat is. In writing the book, ask myself, well, when did I first realize I was black? When did I first become aware that that was an identity I had? And uh, I think I dated to discovering, as I described, uh, walking home from school with, with all uh, of the kids in the third grade, in my third grade, or a lot of them. And, and we were talking about what we were going to do. This is the last day of school, and we were talking about what we were going to do in the summer. And uh, uh, somebody said, yeah, but we, can't, we can only go swimming in, in uh, the Harvey Park pool except, uh, 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 once, uh, except on, the only time we can do it is on Wednesday afternoons. And uh, I remember just being completely puzzled and stymied by that. Why? And who are we? And who are they? And why would that be the case? And, and then you, so black, it's, it's, you, in those days it was Negro, and you know, so that's what we are. And who's, you know. So it, it was learning about a consequence of this identity that I had to deal with in some way that made me aware of the identity. And, that, and, and then I learned other ones. I had other kinds of experiences uh, other kinds of contingencies tied to that identity that pressured it even more. And so you become, you begin, to, arising from your experience is the sense that, boy, this identity is very important. And I've got to figure this out. And I've got to figure out where it makes a difference and where it doesn't make a difference. And, and, uh, and I'm trying to describe with that kind of an example uh, the process by which we, we develop a sense of having a given social identity. And, and it's having an effect on, on our functioning that way, with that kind of an example. We think of, of intellectual performance as, as kind of irrepressible, that if you've got it, you've got it. And um, that something as uh, Delphic as being worried about confirming a stereotype or being judged in terms of a stereotype, that that probably is not a major factor in your intellectual performance, that it's, it might momentarily affect you, but it wouldn't have any, any long-term effects. So uh, a, a, th a thrust of the research has been to take that on as an empirical question. Does it first, does it seem to have an effect on, can it have an effect on intellectual performance? The answer is yes. In these uh, experiments that um, um, I described in the talk or certainly in the book, uh, you can get a sense of how easy it is to produce these kinds of effects and to show that when that pressure is removed, performance of the group goes way up. I think it is like uh, multitasking. I think that's the term that, that gives people a good image of what the experience is like. You're, at, you're doing two things at once. The task that you're supposed to be doing, at, the, the manifest task at hand, the, the test or participating in class or um, talking to your professor, you're doing that, but you're also worried about whether you're going to be seen stereotypically. and what. And first, you're assessing the chances that that's true, and then you're assessing, you know, well, can I do something that would deflect that, or should I? Can I disprove the stereotype? I mean, your your mind is going through all these these possible responses to the threat, and and um, that is absorbing your resources, and that's going to you're going to pay a price for that on the uh, on the, the test on the performance. Uh, I remember going to a Silicon Valley startup firm once to pick up a former student. And um, when I got there, uh, he introduced me to the CEO who was 26. And everybody else in, in the place was younger than he was. So uh, I, I felt old. And, and the cues in the situation, there were bicycles hanging over the cubicles. And there was music I'd never heard. And there were dogs in the place. And these are things that made me feel, wow, <laughs> I, I, I'm feeling old here. Now, and if, since I was just visiting, it didn't, come, didn't mean anything. But if I had to get a job there and work there and have everybody appreciate my work, I might worry that I would be seen as old and that that would affect how people evaluated my work. And it might be a real pressure for me in that situation. I might have to start paying attention to how much of the way they responded to me was, was driven by 
stereotypes about my age versus my work. It will be start to be a concern. Well, that's a perfect example of how uh, incidental cues in a situation, innocent cues, uh, can affect uh, a person's sense of functioning in a, in, in a situation. And so one first strategy is to try to diminish those cues as much as possible. You can't get rid of all of them. You can see from that example that a lot of them are quite innocent, and you can't get rid of uh, uh, all of them. Then you have to turn to the second area, which is to uh, give this, the person a sense that they're not, uh, if, if, that, they're, that they have a way of coping with them, that they can handle the, the threat that is in the situation, um, to lead to a positive secondary appraisal. 